And the White House severely restricted distribution of memos detailing President Donald Trump's calls with foreign leaders, including Russia's Vladimir Putin and Saudi Arabia's Mohammed bin Salman, after embarrassing leaks of his conversations early in his tenure. That's according to a former White House official. The White House handing, handling of Trump's calls with foreign leaders is at the heart of the of House Democrats' impeachment inquiry. A whistleblower alleges the White the White House tried to lock down Trump's July 25th phone call with Ukraine's new president because officials were worried about Trump's request for help investigating Trump's Democratic rival, Joe Biden. The anonymous whistleblower alleges the White House also tried to cover up the content of other calls by moving memos onto a highly classified computer system. On Friday, the Trump administration confirmed the whistleblower's claim, saying national security lawyers had ordered the change. Meanwhile, Kurt D. Volker has resigned as the Trump administration's special envoy for Ukraine. He's the first casualty of Congress's impeachment inquiry into President Trump's conduct with that country. Volker tended his resignation to Secretary of State Mike Pompeo on Friday within hours of an announcement from three House committees that the veteran diplomat was among State Department officials who would be compelled to testify. A Thursday hearing has been set for Volker. The impeachment inquiry will examine whether Trump abused his office to lean on Ukraine Ukraine's leader to investigate Trump's political rivals and whether the White House tried to cover it up. Russian expert Jeremy Kuzmarov is author of The Russians Are Coming Again. He says that all the hubbub around the whistleblower where is a discussion of U.S. policy towards the Central European country. One thing that disturbs me is that there's no discu- uh, broader discussion of U.S. policy in Ukraine. I mean, if he was cutting aid to Ukraine, that would be a good thing. I mean, he may have done it for the wrong reasons or was purporting to do it for the wrong reasons, but there is a you know dirty war. The, the United States had supported a coup d'etat in February 2014 and was fighting a dirty war in Ukraine, and that aid was helping to facilitate. And also Biden has done some really shady things, So especially that his son was profiting off that coup, very shady, and you know his son had no experience in the oil, ga- oil and gas industry, so why is he being a uh, appointed all of a sudden as board of directors uh, of a major Ukrainian company. It's a form of kind of shameless uh, profiting off U.S. foreign policy intervention after the coup. So there's a lot of wrongdoing uh, in a lot of places, and not just Trump with regards to Ukraine. And this could backfire for the Democrats. Uh, you know, investigation might illuminate more on Biden's activities uh, and also might just shed some light on U.S. foreign policy in Ukraine. And it was really the Obama administration that orchestrated uh, the U.S. support for the coup d'etat in 2014. So uh, not only Trump, but others stand to lose out. And the thing with impeachment is that the Senate is very unlikely to vote for Trump's impeachment. So this could backfire again on the Democrats politically, just like Russiagate did. You mentioned earlier that there was a dirty war in Ukraine. What Define that. What is What do you mean by a dirty war in Ukraine? Following the coup d'etat, uh, because uh, Ukraine had been ruled by uh, a pro-Russian leader, Viktor Yanukovych. Now, there was corruption in his government, but he was elected. Uh, protests broke out in late 2013. Uh, they were presented as these pro-democratic protests, and some of the people in the protests may have been sincere, but uh, a lot of the protesters were paid, and uh, there were far right-wing elements that infiltrated that protest movement, some with neo-Nazi uh, leanings, and they were worshipping Stephen Bandera, who's a Ukrainian nationalist who had collaborated with the Nazis. And they didn't get enough signatures for impeachment, and they forced Yanukovych out through violence and carried out these black flag incidents where they, uh, snipers shot at uh, civilians and tried to blame the Ukrainian uh, military that was still under the control of Yanukovych. And then the eastern provinces are Russian speakers, and their economy is very tied with Russia, and they distrusted the new president. So the new president that was installed, Petro Poroshenko, was a corrupt oligarch. And they passed these language laws uh, that pushed the Ukrainian language. And that was the front in the eastern provinces where they're mostly Russian speaking. So they voted for their autonomy. And the Ukrainian military invaded those provinces. And 13,000 civilians were killed, over a million displaced. And the war is still going on after five years. And the United States was funding all this with uh, providing heavy military, uh, military and other support to the Ukrainian regime and providing military equipment and even military advisors. 
And this started in the Obama administration, and Trump continued with his policy expanding the aid. So Trump has really been continuing Obama's policy towards Ukraine? Obama packaged his non-lethal military aid, and Trump, with some reluctance, agreed to provide lethal military aid, I think some anti-tank weapons. So he actually escalated the degree of U.S. military support. But Obama had initially uh, sent U.S. military advisors, like their regiments from New York as well as Oklahoma, where I live, were sent to Ukraine. And some of the battalions they were training were actually, there were far right-wing elements in the Ukrainian military, some with uh, affinities for Nazism and very anti-Semitic people that were actually being trained by American advisors. So it was very disturbing. And our media is barely covered in the U.S. media. And Russia was blamed for everything, but uh, Russia's intervention really was more reactive. Zelensky, who is the president there? Yeah, he's a comedian. What happened is that following the coup d'etat, uh, the United States helped to install a pro-Western regime led by Petro Poroshenko, who is a billionaire oligarch, uh, and uh, his business was in the chocolate industry. But his regime was uh, extremely corrupt and unpopular, and the government really was mismanaging the economy uh, and, and ratchets up this war in the East. So he was incredibly unpopular. And kind of as a protest vote, uh, in the last election, Ukrainians voted in a comedian with no political experience who had mocked the corruption of the oligarchs like Poroshenko and his television program. And this may spell a new day for Ukraine. You know, he's made some overtures for peace, and there's peace accords. There's a big meeting that's scheduled. Uh, soon between uh, Ukraine, Russia, and some European countries. So there's some hope that the conflict in the East might end. What you're saying is that Zelensky is basically a, a moderate reformer who's looking for a way out of this war, and the United States, the Trump administration, is withholding aid and making other apparently veiled threats to them to get them to do things. The withholding of aid seems to be only was only for a short period because uh, the Congress voted for new new aid provisions. I mean, the war has still been going on under Zelensky. He's saying he wants to end it. Hopefully, these peace talks will lead to an end to the war, but it hasn't ended as of yet. So the United States and Trump administration is still supporting the war with these uh, weapons shipments. And it was only a temporary uh, halt uh, for a very short period, and, and Trump gave the green light. Uh, uh, so... Um, I mean, it's hard to know what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, Zelensky was, uh, his primary financer was an oligarch named Ihor Kolomoisky, who was uh, very deeply involved in the war in eastern Ukraine. So some people don't trust him and see him as a kind of false reformer. Uh, and there are different theories. One theory is that, you know, Trump was trying to kind of move the venue of the Cold War from Russia to China and wanted to put, promote a detente with Russia although there are elements in the U.S. government that have been you know, stirring up a lot of uh, Russophobia. And with the Mueller report, he was under a lot of political pressure maybe to abandon that approach. I think Steve Bannon had that approach, that the real enemy is China, and that the U.S. should uh, forge better relations with Russia to prevent Russia and China lying from each other, you know, lying with each other and forming a powerful bloc against the United States. So I think that was the Bannon strategy that Trump may have wanted to pursue, uh, so some of the meeting, maybe he wa he was trying to encourage a you know peace talks with Russia and end to that conflict, but there was also pressure coming from the other side to sustain uh, bellicose policy towards Russia and to vilify Russia. So uh, it's hard to know exactly uh, what's going on behind the scenes. That's but for I sure. Think yeah, Trump, go ahead. Trump was constrained. Yeah, I, I think he he may have you know, wanted again better relations with Russia, but he may have been constrained. And that's Russian expert Jeremy Kosmorov, the author of The Russians Are Coming Again. And three years ago this month, or next month, the story of the so-called Steele dossier written by Christopher Steele, an intelligence agent and employee of the Democrats, uh, was made public. The memo came days before, or the release of the memo came, or the information about the memo really was released or came from unidentified sources at the time. Uh, came before the Trump victory in 2016 and after the release of a memo by then FBI Chief James Comey accusing Hillary Clinton of hiding emails, uh, a release by Comey, information and a memo by Comey that was often credited with her loss of the election to um, 
President Trump. David Korn is the Washington bureau chief for Mother Jones. He wrote the story uh, back in 2016 in October that broke the existence of the memo, the Steele dossier, uh, days before the 2016 election. It was a massive Russian plot to influence an American election to benefit Donald Trump. That has always been the major story. And the other part of the major story was that during while this was happening, the Trump campaign had interactions with Russian emissaries and Russian cutouts that sent a signal to Russia, to Vladimir Putin's government, that they did not mind this intervention. They welcomed this intervention, as Donald Trump even did publicly when he called on Russian hackers to go hack Hillary Clinton. So that's always... You know, so that part of the story, contacts between the Trump campaign and Russia, Russia having a plot to help Donald Trump win, have always been the essential components of this tale. And that is something that Christopher Steele did capture in a large sense in those memos, even if a lot of the rumors and you know tidbits and, and salacious speculation that he put in the memos have not been proven true. This is a president who now, since before he was president, now as president on numerous occasions, he's openly called, said that it was okay to work with a foreign power, that there's really nothing wrong with that. So is this a, a, an issue, a political issue? Some people say it's okay to work with a foreign power in an election, and others say it isn't? Or is there something well, more going on here? There's a lot that's wrong with that. But let's just look at the most recent news. The, okay, we know it is that Russia attacked the election uh, with uh, very extensive information warfare to influence our, our, our presidential campaign to get the result they wanted Donald Trump in office. So as soon as he gets in office, a few months later, he meets with the Russian ambassador and the Russian foreign minister in the Oval Office. And according to the latest report in the Washington Post, based on three sources who are at this point uh, anonymous, Donald Trump told the Russians, that he was not concerned with the attack. He didn't care about it, which is also giving them a green light to do it again. So here's an attack. It's not a military attack, but it's an attack on the United States, and the guy who's in charge of defending the United States takes an oath and swears to defend the Constitution, and he's telling a foreign adversary that had successfully attacked the United States it's okay if you do it again. We're not going to go after you. This is giving aid and comfort to the enemy. Some people might even want to call this direct treason. Is this a um, a president? I mean, the first thing you think of in a situation like this, if, if what you're saying is as accurate as it might be, that this guy is owe, owes something or somebody owes something to somebody. We don't know if the Russians have anything on him, but he certainly you know, has not punished them. And he's taken Vladimir Putin's side numerous occasions in terms of saying this didn't happen. So they, they seem to be more or less in, uh, in sync. And he's recently tried to get them back into the G7. But the Russians are not in the G7 because they invaded and now have occupied part of Ukraine. And obviously an illegal occupation. Yet here he is going to the president of Ukraine who's trying to figure out what to do to get the Russians out and saying, well, we may give you military weapons that you like if you do me this favor. If you do me this favor and give me political dirt that, you know, is bad for Joe Biden and that also undermines the Mueller investigation, which is about what? It's about the Russian attack on the United States and interactions between the Trump campaign and Russians. It all goes back to Russia, Russia, Russia. It, what about you know, the Ukraine? But you mentioned the Ukraine a minute ago, which is a separate country. The president. Yeah, but the, yeah, yeah, but every but when, when he's talking to the Ukraine president, you know, the key items are really about what to do with Russia. And I wrote a piece this week that describes and explains how releasing this transcript or quasi transcript. We don't know how accurate it is. They don't, they, you know, it's not a word-for-word -word transcription of a tape recording. But in releasing, you know, this memo about his conversation with President Zelensky of, of Ukraine has been a tremendous boom for Russian disinformation. They've gone to town with this because it looks like, indeed, the U.S. and the Ukrainian president 
are involved in some underhanded trades, extortions, quid pro quo, whatever you want to call it. In, in the meantime, you know, Trump is saying publicly, well, you know what? You've got to work it out with Putin. That is not the position of the rest of the Western world, that Ukraine, you're kind of on your own, and you and Putin can work it out. The rest, the, the, the rest of the Western world, the European Union and other allies we've been working with on the sanctions against Russia because of its occupation of Ukraine, the sense is no, there needs to be a united front. And this isn't about negotiating how much territory Putin gets to keep in Ukraine because he invaded it illegally. Everything that we do with Ukraine really seems to be connected to Russia. And what Trump is doing, or has done last week, was to put Ukraine in even a worse position vis-a-vis its conflict with Russia. Giuliani, is he just a uh, errand boy, or is there something going on with Rudy Giuliani? This is you know, kind of crazy that he's out there as the president's personal lawyer, yet he's trying to talk to representatives of a foreign government, of, you know, in, in, in conjunction with Trump's calls to them in order to get political dirt. And now Giuliani says that, you know, he did this basically with the knowledge or approval at the behest of the State Department. And he has text messages to show that, which led uh, Kurt Volker, the special envoy to Ukraine, to resign this week when he got drawn into this. But the question is, okay, so the State Department's envoy to Ukraine was talking to Rudy Giuliani about this effort to get dirt on Biden in Ukraine. Well, who told him to do this? You know, did Donald Trump enlist the State Department through Mike Pompeo or not to work with Rudy Giuliani, his personal henchman, his personal henchman, to get, you know, negative information on a potential political rival. That would mean that it's not just Rudy Giuliani freelancing. It would mean that Donald Trump um, has enlisted the rest of the executive branch in this effort to dig up derogatory information on a, on a political foe. That, I think in a lot of ways that could well be illegal. He's not supposed to be using the U.S. government for his personal political ploys and schemes and purposes. And David Korn is the Washington Bureau Chief for Mother Jones.